Thank you very much. So we'll get started. Uh, my name is Adam Gill. I've worked up at the observatory for about three years now to be on and we got schedule. So I started off as an IT specialist when I took on the duties of shift leader at, at this year actually. So uh, that was this is my first year as a shift leader and Ian can just start it well a couple of them. Yeah, sure. I can talk about myself. What the uh, so yeah, my name is Ian Bailey. Uh, I actually just signed on in June, um, so I've been a fresh new observer since June, and I'm also the education specialist on the ship, so I'm responsible for a lot of the outreach programs, a lot of the connections that we do with local communities, a lot of school work we do, media outreach, and things like that. Uh, I just want to say thank you guys for having us tonight, your keynote speakers. We're really excited to be here to talk about some winter weather and what things look like over where we're from. So. All right, so we'll get started on our next slide here. We'll uh, start off with like really what is the Mount Washington Observatory. So we are a nonprofit organization that, that works on the summit of Mount Washington. Uh, we are not associated with the COG or the on road, uh, but we do uh, work um, through the Sherman Adams building up there on the summit. Uh, we get funding through uh, the National Weather Service via a grant to do our hourly observations and collect data and release it publicly. And then we also are member supported as well. So we do we have a lot of members and fundraising events as well. So we have the Seek the Peak that occurs in July. Um, and then we have our annual appeal, which occurs in at this time, so the last bit of the year is our annual appeal. Uh, but we also do research and education, and Ian will talk a little bit about that. Yeah, we can the next slide, please. Yeah, so we do a lot of work, uh, basically, like I said, reaching out to different schools, universities. Uh, we do get funding and grants that support a lot of the products that we put out, uh, especially from the New Hampshire's uh, Space Grant Consortium. We're doing a lot of different things where we're doing outreach events. So one of our big things is we do what we call Live from the Rock Pile, where if you venture to North Carolina, you get to visit the WDC, which is one of our museums. Um, you actually can connect to the summit and talk to the meteorologists, like yours truly and Adam. Uh, about what's going on in the summit, what it's like to live and work up there. We do a lot of research as well, looking at snowpack and you know, fog and precipitation and things like that. Um, and then a lot of education programs as well, where people come up and learn about the severe weather that we see, you know, what actually fuels it and causes it. Uh, and so we just do a lot of outreach programs like that and connections to classrooms as well. So it's a lot of good work and we're really glad that we can actually do that and provide that service through the grants and things that we do. So it is really nice. Uh, we do have a couple of museums that we operate to. Uh, so we have one down in North Conway, the Weather Discovery Center. We also operate one seasonally up on the Southern Mount Washington. So uh, both those locations help us earn revenue as well through museum admissions, and it gives us a little bit of history of the Mount Washington territory, as well as what we do. So, uh, so one thing we do every day is um, is our hourly observations. So go on the next slide. Ian will talk a little bit about that since it's been training. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, so there is actually a lot that goes into our hourly observations, and so part of our contract that we have with the National Weather Service is every hour, usually on the 45 or the 58 past the hour, we go outside and we're recording literally everything that we see. So we look at temperature, we look at dew point, we look at cloud cover, we're seeing what's going on in the sky above, whether or not we're in the fog, what's going on with wind, and things like that. And so we gather all that information out from the observation deck, and we actually bring it inside uh, and write it down on all the paperwork, actually go back one. Uh, all the paperwork that you see there in the bottom right hand corner. And so while we do everything digitally, uh, we also still record things in paper form as well. And so there's a lot of information that we're gathering, putting it into those records and sending out to the National Weather Service. And it's one of the biggest things that we're responsible for up there. So there's a lot that goes into that. So uh, every day we release a uh, forecast at about 5 a.m. and 5 p.m. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about the forecasting if we go further on. But uh, at first, uh, 5 a.m. Uh, forecast that we do is done by our staff and meteorologists, so they do it in the overnight hours and it's released at 5 a.m. And that's our official forecast. Um, and at 5 p.m., we do a second forecast that we allow our interns to do. So we have interns that come up and they will uh, help out. One of the tasks is to do the afternoon forecast. Uh, so uh, we only do a 48 hour forecast on Mount Washington. So when we've done projects, we look at forecast verification and really beyond 48 hours to get that unpredictability of Mount Washington's weather. Uh, the forecast is just too bad, so we'd rather lose the quality of products that's what we're using to do uh, 14 hours out. Yeah. The next slide. So I had mentioned just a moment ago that we do have interns, and so we do have a really profound intern program that we have at the summit, uh, where they come up and spend a couple of months out of the year with us working on a research project from like I think you know snowpack is the current one that we're working on right now. A lot of research with fog and temperature as well. 
Um, and they're also responsible for a lot of other you know, duties that happen throughout the ship. So they'll give tours to people who come up to the observatory, uh, they work on the afternoon forecast, they'll do a lot of maintenance work as well. Uh, and so it's a really unique opportunity for people to come up and you know, live with us, work on an actual project, and see what it's like to be in such an environment. And a lot of the interns um, go on to do lots of different things, but some of them actually come back. So all the people who are on our staff right now were actually previously interns, which I think is kind of cool. Okay, so we move on to why we do manual observations. So many locations have moved to ASOS or any lost stations that are unmanned. Uh, but here on the summit of Mount Washington, due to the weather that we see, uh, we actually have to stay manned here around to be able to keep up with the icy conditions, fix the instrumentation as they break, because they do break all the time. Um, one of the things you have to do is the ice instrumentation stuff. A bunch of those pictures are going up with a crowbar to knock ice off the instrumentation. A lot of people ask why don't we heat our instruments, and we actually do heat our instruments. Um, our main management has over 2,000 watts of heating. Um, we're seeing my ice growing at 6 to 8 inches per hour. Unfortunately, that overpowers any sort of heating that we have, and we still have to go up and knock it off or else uh, the wind instruments stop working. Which every once in a while we have a storm that's so bad we can't even get up to the top of the tower to the end. So there's been a few storms that have been up before there before that I wonder what the highest wind speed actually was, uh, especially with the really changing. Just frustrated inside with the wind going down at 80 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour. It's really not that low. Um, and then also reliability. Uh, so, a lot of these instruments are actually, uh, we have analog backups as well. So, uh, they don't need power to run. So, when you do lose power or something happens where we uh, don't have any power, uh, we are still able to collect that and do it by hand. So, we can still, uh, one of the paper charts we had up earlier has our wind speed on it and can calculate the wind speed on the paper. Performs there. Um, so, Ian is going to explain about why we experience the extreme weather that we do. Next slide, please. Actually, before we get to that, uh, we can't forget about the video we wanted to show. Uh, so, we mentioned a moment ago about de icing, uh, basically, how it's really important that we go outside and make sure that the instruments are free of ice so that we have an accurate record. Uh, and so, part of that responsibility is doing that in some of the worst weather that you might see. Uh, so, we actually have a video of our crew going up and de icing in 120 mile an hour wind gusts in the middle of the night. And so, we wanted to share that with you guys and just kind of talk you through that process real quick. So, let's roll the video. So, we never actually do this alone. Uh, we actually do grow up, go up as a crew. Uh, a lot of people ask if we can use like, harnesses or ropes to strap ourselves to the top of the tower. And the answer is no, uh, because those straps can actually snap in the force of the wind and become a weapon really, really quick. Um, so we're using just our sheer strength uh, to hold us against the side of the tower there. Um, and the other two observers are down on our parapet to kind of spot them uh, if they happen to get blown off the top of the tower. Um, so they kind of lock themselves in place there, and then we usually take curl bombs or heavy mats, and we'll whack the side of the parapet. You never hit the instruments directly, they're very expensive, and that's a good way to get fired. Um, so you hit the side of the tower, and then you create vibrations that shake the ice loose, uh, which allows the instrument to rotate freely in the way once again. So uh, it's one of the more exciting things that we have have to do as part of our job. Uh, sometimes we have to do that. Oh, thank you. Uh, sometimes we have to do that on the order of every 15 minutes, uh, and it can get a little intense, uh, but we just wanted to share that with you guys because we, we're a little crazy and we think it's a lot of fun. So, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the, some of the manual instrumentation we have inside. Okay, so uh, this is a picture of our manual instrumentation. So up there in the top left there is actually our wind chart. So that was a pretty significant event. I don't know if you guys remember from 2015 with the Kate Molotov that tried to hike Mount Washington. So that was a wind chart from that day. The winds were gusting over 140 miles an hour with temperatures down to 37 below zero. So definitely not a good day to be out hiking, uh, but she tried anyways. Uh, and then we also have a couple other instruments. We still use Mercury barometers. So uh, every uh, couple of days we will calibrate our aircraft using the Mercury barometer. So we still have both old school instrumentation as well as modern machines. So that that's back to you. Oh it's, it's going to you. All right, so yeah, what we mentioned before, why do we get the extreme weather that we do? And it's actually kind of a combination of three different things. It's our prominence, it's our storm tracks, and it's in a process called the Venturi effect. So in regards to our prominence, if you go from Mount Washington west, you're not going to encounter another structure or object that's nearly tall as we are, all the way until you get to the Northern Great Plains. Uh, the Black Hills, I believe, is where we're going with that one. So there's really nothing obstructing that wind flow that really helps slow it down. There's not a whole lot of frictional force to kind of bash that wind out of it. So we're getting the full brunt of whatever comes our way. And then in regards to storm tracks, most of the storms that we see are actually coming from the northwest, the west, and the southwest. That picture you see in the bottom left there is actually a study that we did looking at storm tracks over a 30-year period. 
and you'll see, I don't know how well it is to see, but uh, that bright star emits all of the red arrows. That's where Mount Washington is, and so we're affectionately known as the tailpipe of the United States as far as weather patterns are concerned. So in one way or another, most storms are actually making their way to our area and impacting us either directly or on the peripheral of the storm. So we're getting everything coming from the west and northwest, and the way that the presidential is actually structured, they're actually like a funnel. So you have the northern presidentials and the southern presidentials, which create a funnel that actually opens up to the west, where all of our storms are coming from. Those storm systems will actually move into that funnel and get compressed, and that compression through the Venturi effect actually causes an acceleration in the winds before it even starts coming up to the summit. Then it rockets its way up the side of the mountain, shoots over the top of the summit, and actually encounters a layer called the tropopause, which is essentially the top of the atmosphere where we see most of our weather patterns. And it's a very stable layer of the atmosphere. It kind of acts like a lid. So the wind blasts up over the summit, can't go any higher than the tropopause, and it's actually squeezed again in the vertical and causes a secondary acceleration as it goes across the summit. And so when you get these two compression factors, it causes the intense winds that we see. And then you get blowing snow, ice chunks, freezing precipitation, all as a result of these high winds and frigid temperatures that we see in the sun. All right. And for the next slide, we talk a little bit about forecasting. So now we have more the real interesting stuff. So I'm going to actually focus on forecasting snow up on Mount Washington since this is a ski event. Uh, we mostly use forecast soundings when it comes to forecasting snow. Unfortunately, due to the Mount Washington comments, a lot of the models are gridded, so uh, the mountains get smoothed over, so we actually have to kind of use more forecasting methods to forecast up on the summit. Um, so, what the forecast soundings help us determine is uh, determine how cold it is going to be at the summit, uh, how unstable the atmosphere is, if there's good conditions for upslope snow. So, up on Mount Washington, a lot of times we have a main, like a Northeastern come through. And we'll get six to eight inches of snow out of the, uh, the main initial snowstorm. But then on the back side of it, if there's enough moisture wrapping around, we'll get upslope snow shovels. We'll get another six to eight inches of snow wherever down in North Conway or any other valley location, it's nice and sunny. Um, so we do look at forecast summits and it's really steep latch rates, or if we have uh, temperatures at the summit cold enough, it's in the dendritic growth zone for snowflakes this far. Um, we look for that to see how much of the atmosphere will be in that zone. Help us determine the intensity of the upslope and snow events. Um, also, another thing is look at how much moisture is in the lower part of the atmosphere. Uh, that's one thing that Mount Washington is notorious for is the fog. So, a lot of times you come up, you might have a view that's only a few hundred feet, and that's pretty common, largely due to how much moisture is here on the east coast. So, we look at how low those cloud heights are, and if you have a ton of that moisture, it can also help enhance any sort of snowfall. Um, so, then the next thing we have to look for is what location of the low pressure system means. So, a storm like this, you're in the warm side here, and Ian will talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so like I mentioned, so we do take a lot of this into account, a lot of forecast products and things like that. Um, but we're also looking at maps too, if you want to show us the next slide there. Uh, and so, where we are in relation to the low pressure system actually tells us a lot about what kind of weather we're going to get. So, like what we saw today, like what Adam mentioned, a warm front moved through. And we find ourselves in the warm sector of the low, kind of in between the two fronts there. So we have a lot of warm, wet air that's you know, hovering right near freezing. And so we're going to see a lot of heavy precipitation, which probably is going to fall as rain, unfortunately. However, uh, the cold front will move through eventually. So when you find yourself behind the cold front, we're going to be expecting more snow, frozen precipitation, and slightly higher winds. Or our personal favorite, when you're in the top left in the deformation zone of a little pressure, that's when we see the 120 mile an hour winds across the summit, and that's when we get to go to de-ice and get blown off the top of our tower. Uh, and so where we are in relation to the center of the low pressure is super important. And also what kind of low pressure is moving through. So we talked momently, uh, momentarily about a nor'easter moving through, and so that happens pretty frequently here on the eastern seaboard. Uh, and so when we see nor'easters, we're expecting a lot of heavy precipitation and high winds. Uh, when we see Alberta clippers coming through when they come, uh, we expect a lot more higher winds as well, so in the 130, 140 mile an hour range in the most extreme cases. And so knowing what kind of low pressure is on its way and where we fall and how it is moving through our area tells us a lot about what kind of stuff we're going to put into our forecast product. Then we'll also look at wind speeds. So uh, on the next slide here, we kind of have our model output statistics and we look at the pressure gradient. So a lot of times in models, we'll see a 35 knot wind speed at 850 millibars, which is about 5,000 feet. And on the summit of Washington, we'll be seeing 80 to 90 mile an hour winds. So there's a lot of things that factor into what causes the acceleration of the wind speeds. So with loss, it usually takes um, forecast model output, takes into uh, factors in our observations and corrects for uh, the possibility of the wind speed. 
Uh, so that gives us a good base, and then we look at, um, like once again, we look at the forecast on and see how low the total clause is, and see how stable the atmosphere is, and see how much more acceleration we'll get out of wind speeds, and we'll adjust our numbers accordingly. Um, so we usually uh, don't wait too much on models as much as uh, maybe for our lower and forecasting, so it becomes a lot of experience. So we do have discussions every day, kind of going to work like, hey, what about? Is this going to factor into wind speeds? Is this stable atmosphere going to accelerate wind speeds? Or is this stable atmosphere going to be more turbulent and make some um, and cause wind speeds to slow down? And so we do have that forecast on it and try to adjust our numbers accordingly. Okay. And then the last part is forecast uh, fog, and then we'll go up to the summit. Yeah, so just to kind of put the icing on the cake as far as difficulty in forecasting. So you wouldn't expect it, but actually deciding whether or not we're going to be in the fog, whether or not to put that in a forecast product, actually there is a lot more that goes into it. You can look at the model numbers, and you can look at what all the computer model runs are trying to show you, and you'd be like, all right, yeah, I'm pretty much guaranteeing that we're going to be in the fog. You know, there might be a one degree difference between temperature and dew point, but then it'll be fine. And then the very next day you walk outside, and you're like, oh, we are in the clear, or we are in and out of the clouds, uh, and that person over there is yelling at me. <laughs> so, I mean, they're really, the whole point we're trying to talk about is that, you know, there is a lot that goes into these forecast products, and you, you know, you can look at model numbers, you can look at all the information that's presented to you, but there's just so many different things that are happening that are going into what makes the weather on top of the mountain, uh, that sometimes you can be a little bit off, and uh, like it was mentioned before by the President, uh, we do catch a lot of flat for it, uh, but we do the very best that we can, so. Right, and then we'll step on up to the summit, actually, and uh, visit one of the observers who are up there now. And also get uh, an idea of what's actually happening up there. So, we have a couple backup plans. We've been running the internet issues since we have had. Usually, uh, we are going to get up there comes to the microwave dish. So, um, when we have when we have ice storms, uh, especially with glaze ice, we don't aren't able to get the communication. So sometimes we run into internet issues, but it can go through round fun. So, um, yeah.
little snow is when your asses hits Mount Washington and has nowhere to go but up. So um, this precipitation is formed by air mass moving up. Uh, so as the air is coming up the slope of Mount Washington, it's forced to eventually release precipitation. So that causes that snow that we see. Okay. Other questions? Yes. What is the fact behind you the world versus the Alright, so um, the big thing that we have is a combination of very uh, extreme factors. So, um, Antarctica has extreme cold, so they get much colder than we do, but they don't really have any wind. So, uh, now I saw people down there, they might get up to like 45 miles an hour at the South Pole, but that's about it. That's about 100 degrees below zero. Um, snowfalls and other things. We see a lot of snow. It's one of the highest elevation, but not the highest. So, like Paradise Major Station in on Mount Rapido sees over 600 inches of snow per year. We see about 300 inches of snow, which is a lot, but it's not the most. And then, if you have wind, so we actually have the windiest location in the world, and at least that's what's observed for our average wind speed is 35 miles an hour. And during the winter season, we actually have about 50 miles an hour average in uh, January. So, a uh, combination of high, high amounts of snow. Winds and coal is what kind of leads to a fact of Good question. One kind of simple is I'm sure you work in ships and uh, in the middle of the winter, is that a way to grow? Uh, that's a very good question. So yes, we do work in shifts. Uh, so we work for seven days at a time. Uh, so it's usually Wednesday to Wednesday, and there is an entire seven crew. They're the ones that are on the summit right now, so that we can be here. Uh, and so we'll work for seven days straight, uh, and then we do a shift change on Wednesday where we'll get to go down and recover for seven days, and then get to go back up. Uh, but the way we get up there in the winter is actually a snow cap, you know, similar to the machines that are grooming the side of the ski resort. Uh, and so it's, they are runs on tank treads. It's very large, and it's a giant plow on the front. Uh, so we're basically driving that on top of the snow-covered auto road all the way to the top, and so we're kind of like pushing our way through snow drifts. We're not actually plowing all the way down to the road itself, because then you're plowing through about 20 to 30 feet of snow. Uh, so we basically just kind of try to plow our way across the top of the snow-covered auto the road to the top, and we don't always make it. Uh, sometimes uh, we actually turn around and go back down, uh, and so you can get trapped up there for a couple of days, but we do have plenty of provisions and uh, enough living space up there where we can stay for 14 days before we absolutely need to get down. And your second question. Yes, the, uh, I've always heard about the So generally speaking, like the top of the troposphere is like in the 20,000 to like 40,000 foot range during the summer season. Now it actually does compress during the winter season. And so as far as in relation to where we are, during the summer months, you might have upwards of 10,000 feet of space between the summit and the top of the troposphere. In the winter, that can shrink down to as low as about 6,000 feet. And so that's why generally speaking, during the winter season, we see a lot more extreme weather events because they're getting such more, a much more profound effect from that compression, just from the colder temperatures and the positioning of the planet. Well, if the troposphere is the 12,000 feet during the winter here, uh, what is it in California called that? Yeah, so it, is, it depends on the type of air masses that we see. So out in the west, they have a lot of modified air masses coming in off the Pacific. So if you look at average tropoplasma heights from the fourth weather we would launch in Seattle, it's up to around it's 20 to 30,000 feet in the wintertime and closer to 40 to 50 in the summertime. Here on the East Coast, since we kind of have a gateway to the Arctic where we have, we have a lot of cold continental air masses that come in that are very dense. So that helps uh, lower the tropopause down to as low as like 10 to 15,000 feet. A few of the events have been up on the summit oceanic ozone detector because uh, Saturday's launch from Albany showed that tropopause at about 7,000 feet from Albany. So on the summit, you might have been actually in the stratosphere. So I would hope that we actually have higher amounts of ozone. Yes, yes, that is Yeah, a uh, question. Uh, how long were you guys from Mount Washington Observatory years ago when you were no longer the strongest wind speed on the, on the planet? And uh, do you think it will ever be exceeded or met again because of the change in location from where it was originally measured? That's a good question. That's why you have to have a lot. And I also think that we have to change up our instrumentation. So we use uh, PO2. Um, right now, from wind speeds. So it has a long pressure tube that goes out in the weather room. So we're working on actually trying to shorten up that tube because we know we're seeing damage in that. 
So we're likely not reporting as high on green gusts as we are, because there's been times where it's sustained under 120 on the summit, it's only gusting like 125, so they have very little variability, especially when it's cold. So we've always been theory, theorized that if we shorten the tube length, you'll be able to get a more um, a better precision for them by this less of a dampening effect for wind gusting. We can actually measure high on wind gusting. We've tried it a few times with sonic and others, but with icing, we don't see much. So we haven't seen as much as that. A five to ten percent increase in gust speed using the sonic for some current system. So it could be at the change in instrumentation and also once again the change in locations where highest wind gusts which you know, it's not these since winds come off the Atlantic, but it wasn't necessarily through the Mount Washington Valley and now on the northwest side. We thought it was in the Caribbean wrong because it's still you know, reported the highest wind gusts ever measured in the northern hemisphere, right? So what is that? That was a two hundred and thirty one, right? Yeah, so that was 231 miles an hour. Um, that was actually, I love to tell my story. Uh, that was actually in 1934. Uh, and so 231 mile an hour is well above category five hurricane force winds. And the, the gentlemen that observed that uh, were basically in a log cabin on the top of Mount Washington <laughs> with heavy metal chains on it. Uh, and so if you can try to imagine being in a log cabin in the 1930s <laughs> no, no. and well above category five hurricane force winds, uh, we actually do have the record book from that day and we don't share it with people for a good reason. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just, it's impressive. And also to kind of follow up on your other question, um, so it's impressive to think that we actually had a person there to actually observe it, whereas the new world record it was observed by who? Uh, so we still kind of cling to the fact that we had an actual individual person there to report 231 mile an hour winds. So, yes. The Barrow Island, Barrow Island, Australia. The other factor I think for the 231 for us, the 10 minute average wind speed for that event was 188 miles an hour. However, the 10 minute average for the 253 on Barrow was only 110. So it's likely a tornado might have actually hit the site more than a natural straight line would have been. And so just to, I know these are all really fantastic questions. We did want to throw one more little bit here into our talks, just to kind of talk about some of our experiences with the winter weather. Uh, it's a recurring theme. You know, a lot of people talk about, you know, a lot of people actually tell us that we're insane uh, for going outside in these crazy conditions, but it just kind of drives home the fact that, you know, it's, it's okay to participate in winter sports and to be outside in these crazy conditions so long as you are prepared. And so my personal experience actually just happened over this Thanksgiving, uh, where we actually dropped to negative 26 degrees on top of the summit with 80 mile an hour winds that put our wind chills at negative 70 degrees. Uh, and so initially we were talking about how we probably shouldn't go outside uh, and then just stay inside and enjoy Thanksgiving and all of that. Uh, but we're like, no, we have the proper gear, we can create a plan, and we all suited up and double, triple layered all of our things and actually went outside and enjoyed the extreme cold. Uh, so we ran a couple of cold weather experiments, uh, which were first meaning you could do the boiling water into the air and immediately make snow. That's really cool. Uh, we took it to the next level though, so we actually uh, took a banana and threw it out into the snow drift uh, and left it out there in sub-zero temperatures for about an hour and came back and the banana was so frozen solid that we could actually use it as a hammer. So this is actually you know, as the banana hammer experiment uh, where we actually drove a small nail and a roofing nail all the way into a 2x4 uh, and then actually helped. Uh, just using the banana. Uh, and then we also flash froze some eggs, uh, so we made some fried eggs on a skillet, uh, just from putting the skillet out there into the freezing cold. It was so cold that it actually cooked the eggs. Uh, and then we also froze a bowl of ramen uh, on a fork, and so that was affectionately known as the ramen lolly. Um, so, just to drive home that point that if you are prepared, if you have the right gear, if you do the research, if you look into where you're going, uh, there's no reason to just kind of stay inside and hide from the weather unless it's absolutely too abysmally dangerous. Uh, enough to the point where we were going outside in those insane conditions just to have a little fun. So that's my experience.